today's sermon text is found in verse 21 of Romans 12, in which we read earlier. Let us be reminded of God's most precious words in Romans 12, 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It is plain, isn't it, to see that there is so much evil in this present world in which we live in. We can see it all around us. We can see how it's manifested in every part of our lives. And as some of you know already that um, I've been in touch with a, a friend recently up in Scotland, an old friend, who's not yet a Christian, and I really feel that the Lord is drawing him. And he said recently to me how he sees so much evil in this world, and how he, he, he recognizes there's so much evil in his life, in, around him, and, and in society. And I asked him the question, well, well, where do you think that evil comes from? We see goodness in the world, and we see so much evil. Where does it we come from? And, uh, and he's thinking about these things. And friends, we see so much of, of evil around the world, don't we? And the Apostle Paul, of all men, uh, knew of this evil. He was a very religious man, and yet he was a persecutor of God's people. He killed Christians, uh, those who were following Christ. He called himself the chief of sinners. However, by the grace of God, his life was completely transformed, wasn't it? And so there is a way for us to know good in an evil world. There is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There is a way for us to be transformed from this present evil world uh, to, by knowing the free grace and goodness of God. And it is really this which I would like to speak to our hearts today about the great transformation that God can do in our lives by his free grace and mercy. And so for today's sermon, please consider the following three points. Please consider the following three points. Firstly, the source and power of evil. Where is the source? Where, does the, where is the source and power of evil come from? Secondly, our response to this evil in our lives. How do we respond if we understand the source and the power of evil? How do we respond to it in our lives, secondly? And thirdly, overcoming evil with good. Overcoming evil with good. Three points for us to consider. And so firstly, the source and power of evil. Where does it come from? Our text set before us today says, Be not overcome of evil. Be not overcome of evil. In order for us to understand where evil comes from, we must understand the where it comes from, where the power thereof comes from. And like any army that goes to war, unless they understand their enemy and the force of their enemy, how will they be able to stand against their enemy? And so the first principle of any warfare, and this is a spiritual warfare, is to understand our enemies. That's, that's the greatest, one of the first principles of warfare. Understand your enemy. Understand the force and the power of your enemy. And if we seek to overcome evil in our lives, we must therefore understand our enemies. We must understand how equipped they are and if, whether we are equipped to even take on enemies. And we see this in warfare. If a, a nation goes against another nation or an army against another army, they need to first find out, are we properly equipped to take on this other army, to take on this other nation? Uh, are they too powerful for us? Are they too, is, is there too much force behind them? The Bible is very clear in this respect, in this respect isn't it? Where 
evil comes from. Understanding this is vital if we truly want to overcome evil with good in our lives. Mark 7, 21 through 23 from God's Word says, From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornifications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. God's word certainly doesn't flatter us, does it? And I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, that person's got a good heart. That's what the world says, he's got a good heart. Well, of course, and the Bible is the truth that doesn't flatter our fantasies. It tells us what we need to hear. Evil comes straight from within our own hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, God can know our hearts. It says the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is the greatest deceiver that we have. It says that it's desperately wicked, and who can know it? Desperately wicked. Our hearts are like a fugitive on the run from God, like Cain, always running away from God, like a fugitive, desperate, uh, always running from God, always running from one's maker. And friends, you don't have to go too far, do you, to understand where evil comes from? Because it comes from within our own hearts, out of the heart of men, God's word says. Therefore, if we truly want to overcome evil in our lives and how it manifests itself in breaking down every good thing in our lives, friends, we must make our heart the chief suspect in this. We must be very suspicious of our own heart. However, I must say, in saying this, our sinful hearts by nature do not work alone, do they? They have accomplices. They have collaborators. Who are these collaborators? Who are these co-evil workers and sinful helpers of our hearts? It is the devil. It is Satan. And of course, this present evil world in which we live in. The devil, you see, is the tempter who says to our hearts, Yea, have God said? He always brings doubt, you see, into our hearts. Have God really said to love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength? Has God really said these things? He serves the, the world up, as it were. All the sinful things in this world, he serves them up and glosses over them on a plate to our sinful hearts' desires. The devil opposes everything good and true and wholesome that God stands for. He uses this world's sinful influences to advertise them to our hearts. And have you ever wondered why there is so much violence and debauchery and filth and bad language and gossip and backbiting, and vanity, and all these filthy things, these awful things, within our society today, within many homes today. Well, because there's a demand for these things, isn't there? On those fault, those tellers of lies, those TVs, those widescreens that many people have in their homes. Well, why is there a demand for violent movies? For just movies that are just full of jesting? and uh, filth and debauchery and blasphemy and bad language and disobedience and everything that opposes God. Why is there so much um, uh, awfulness, wickedness on TVs? Because there's a demand for it in the hearts of men, women and children. Parents have no problem nowadays showing their children wicked things, action movies full of violence. Full of filth and 
and swearing and blasphemy. And it's the simple laws of economics, supply and demand. If there were not a demand for these things, the, people, the producers would not supply these things. And that's where we see so much wickedness. And that's why we see our society calling uh, good evil, because there's a demand from the very hearts of, of, of men. That's why we live in the wicked days that we do, because, because there's a demand from these things. The, the evil that we see so all around us in our society comes from the heart. Now, the demand for evil is not only seen within secular circles, as I touched on a little bit earlier with the, with the uh, Apostle Paul, we see it increasingly, don't we, coming into many churches in the form of false teaching, bad practice, bad practice always, always affects good doctrine, and false teaching and distortion of God's word. You see, the devil always wants to corrupt not only things in secular circles, but he also wants to corrupt the church of Jesus Christ. Many churches have turned aside to a feelings-based Christianity of will worship and interpreting the scriptures how they feel that they want to, uh, picking and choosing what they want and what they don't want. They have moved away from the doctrines of grace where most evangelicals a hundred years ago, most of them in the West, you wouldn't even question the doctrines of grace. You wouldn't even question the authority of scripture. Many how to these things. And now, of course, people have moved away to a feelings-based, cherry-picking type of Christianity that has been massively infiltrated by bad practice. Sin and evil has corrupted every facet of our lives, including many churches today. Now, now that we understand really the source of where evil comes from uh, and, and uh, the power of it within our hearts and within our lives, how it corrupts every good thing, we must acknowledge that in our own strength, we are no match for this evil. We are no match for the force of evil within our hearts and within our lives. That corruption is too great for us. And friends, if we, if, we, if we have been brought to understand the evil within our hearts, and by the grace of God, we must realise how utterly unequipped we are by nature in overcoming this evil in our lives by our own morality. So many people, you see, are trying to overcome this evil, the sin from within by their own morality. Well, I'll try to do these things in life. And of course it's to be applauded. We are to put good things in our life. We are to do these things. But we cannot save ourselves by our own morality. We cannot become a monk and live in the middle of the desert and try to uh, fast and do all these things. Sin and evil still reigns within the hearts. A monk will probably be wishing he was in the city, living it up, as it were. Sin and evil is still there and it's only a matter of time before it manifests itself. And so friends, if you have come to know of these truths, not only intellectually, but experimentally, that the wickedness that lies within each and every one of our hearts, the evil that lies by the fall of Adam into sin, and how it's like a drop that has fallen upon the water, the ripples have come to us nowadays. We have been infiltrated, we have Adam's blood, uh, through our veins, and friends, the effects if, if it's done in your life, and, and that's in the lives of others, and how you can influence people by your evil heart. If, if you have truly been brought to understand of the depravity of your own hearts, of the evil that lies within, you will want to know how to respond to this evil within your heart and within your life. And so this brings us to our second point for today, our response to evil, our response to evil. The Bible is very clear if God has brought us to understand the evil within the world and how that evil comes from within the heart of men and how it's manifested in, in that way. That's why we see so many broken families and hardship and sickness and sadness in the world. 
If God has brought you to see that, the Bible is very clear in how we respond to it. Psalm 37, 27 of God's most precious words says, Depart from evil and do good and dwell forever more. The first step of grace is to turn from evil to that which is good, to turn from sin and evil and to seek after and cleave to that which is good. It is of paramount importance that, that if we are being called of God, like it says in Ephesians 2, herein have you been quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. If God is revealing these things in our life and is drawing us to himself and showing us the depravity and the sin within, we, how, we, how we respond is to immediately depart from evil in our life at once from evil and sin and cleave to that which is good and frame our life and after the things of God, give ourselves to the reading of God's word, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Proverbs 3, 7 says, be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Don't think that you've got all the answers in life. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Those who claim to be Christians and are still living in sin, still abounding in sin, going to nightclubs, still doing wicked things, this is not true of them. True Christians are those who walk in the way of holiness and uh, obedience to Christ's words. And uh, although I'm not preaching perfectionism here, because we all fall short. There is a departure from sin and evil. Proverbs 4.27 says, Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Remove thy foot from evil. This is how someone by the grace and mercy of God uh, responds to evil. They remove those things. There's a transforming effect in someone's life. A new desire, a new creature in Christ, a transforming. I no longer want to live in sin in the things of this world. I'm now being drawn to Christ and that which is good. When the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, calls his sheep by his mercy and by his grace, they leave what they are doing before and they follow him, don't they? They turn from sin and from their evil and follow Christ. Friends, there is no other way to heaven but by the way of holiness and obedience in Christ. And so like I said before, if people claim to be Christians and they are not living in obedience and holiness of life to Christ, you've got to question if there has not been a true transformation in their life, a true departing from evil. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not saying that Christians are perfect, we can fall. We can backslide. I have fallen and backslidden. But the general principle is that we're going forward in the Lord. There's a work of grace in the heart. There's a new desire. There's a transforming effect by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is holy. And therefore, it seeks to live a holy life, being transformed by the grace of God. I suppose the reason why so many people have a dim response to evil is because of the manner in which it has been desensitized in our depraved culture. Have you ever thought about that? When we read about the Christians a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, and we think about the way they lived their lives, and of course cultures change, of course, so different things happen, but evil has been so desensitized in our cultures, people have become so accepting of it, even in many churches today, accepting of such wickedness, which would have been seen as apostasy 100, 200 years ago. And dare I say, people even joking about evil and casualizing evil and calling a good evil. Isaiah 5.20 rings true of the days that we live in, doesn't it? Woe unto them that call evil good. 
woe unto them, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Those who are being called of God, uh, who understand the source of evil, the primary source of evil, that it's from within, evil from within, the sin from within, and who respond to his calling and to his quickening, no longer casualize evil in their life. They no longer justify evil. It becomes exceedingly sinful. They treat it for what it is. They treat it for the evil that has separated them from the love of Christ. It separates us from God. And they treat it as such, from a holy God. That's what our sin and our, and our, and our evil nature has done. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way. Proverbs 8.13. It's almost like a contradiction of words, isn't it? Who would fear the Lord? Such a loving, gracious, merciful, uh, long-suffering, forbearing Lord. Who would fear the Lord? It's talking about a filia fear here, isn't it? Because Christ has shown you such love and mercy. Because he's been so patient and long-suffering. He hasn't given me what I deserve. He hasn't uh, all the sins, all the wickedness I've shown in my life, and yet he's still calling me, he's still, he's still reaching an, an arm out to me, as it were. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way. If someone has truly been called of God, and is responding to the gospel call, evil, sin, becomes exceedingly sinful. There's a fear a filial fear of the Lord, of letting him down, of, of showing such ingratitude for someone who's been so loving and kind and merciful to us. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy. That's a promise of God. He will have mercy. On him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You have abundant sins? I have, I have abundant sins? But many sins. He will abundantly pardon every one of them. Every sin, sinful thoughts of the heart, of the mind, and every act, sinful act, every proud word, a lifetime cleansed. He will abundantly pardon. Oh, what a wonderful Saviour that we have, friends. And so, dearly beloved of the Lord, we've spoken about where evil comes from, the source, primary source of evil. We've spoken about our response to evil, how we are to respond to it. And thirdly, and, and our third point which we will conclude on is overcoming evil with good. How do we overcome such evil? In our lives, Romans 12, 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. But overcome evil with good. That word, overcome, is, is a very important word, isn't it? Whenever God's word mentions something twice within a text, it should really prick our ears up. God is telling us something. It mentions overcome twice here. Why does it put such an emphasis upon the word overcome? Well, it tells us really that we can either be overcome by evil, and of course there are consequences to that, or we can be overcome by good. There is a way to overcome evil by good. There is a way to overcome the corruption within, the sin from within. There is a way to overcome these things. And so firstly, it tells us and confirms that evil in our hearts can be overcome in our lives. There is a way. It is possible to overcome evil and sin and corruption in our lives. Don't casualize sin and evil. You can overcome it. It is possible by God's mercy and grace. And secondly, 
That word overcome, it tells us that it is upon each and every one of us, man, woman and child, to seek to overcome this evil within us. Don't just feel like, I, I can't fight against it, I can't, I can't do anything about this evil, it's too strong for me. The impulses, the urges to evil in my heart and my life, and that of others, is too much for me. Well, God's word says here that it is possible to overcome. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. In fact, we all have a responsibility to seek to overcome evil in our life. We must act and respond upon God's word. The grace of God does not mean that we don't have to act. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We are to prioritize the things of God, to frame our life around the things of God. If God is calling us, we are to depart from evil, the evil way. We are to, to frame our life and put those things in our life that are conducive to his salvation and his mercy. That's what God wants us to do, to depart from those things. If we truly want to know the Lord savingly, we must act upon the calling that God is calling us in his word. Because there is an eternity to come. Because there is a final destination for each and every one of our souls. Do not believe the lie that when you die, that's it. Don't believe in that lie. I've heard it so many times before. When you die, that's it. So many colleagues, so many people. When you die, that's it. And that's their hope. That's their hope for many people. That there's no judgment. That there's no eternity. Eternity will all be ushered into eternity. Eternity will soon be upon us. And just as we can testify to a goodness and an evil in the world, because of course we're made in the image of God, so we can testify when I feel loved. It's nice to be loved. When someone says a kind word or has been charitable to me, those are good things, aren't they? But also, I can feel the effects of my sin upon others, and, and others upon me. I, I, I can testify to, to evil and to goodness in the world. Where does this evil come from? Where does this darkness come from? Where does the light come from? Where does right and wrong come from? Or am I just ignoring the voice of God, my conscience? Am I just ignoring the, the heavens that declare the glory of God? Am I just casualizing sin and evil in my life. And so too in an eternity will come, there will be, so to eternity there will be a heaven and a hell. Just as sure as there is a good, a good, a goodness and an evil, so too there must be a heaven and a hell. A heaven to those who acknowledge and confess their inner evil and sin and respond to the call of the gospel and act and depart from evil and turn from it. For why will you die, spiritually speaking, for eternity and not live? Act upon the gospel call. Respond to the gospel call and live and depart from evil and to seek God's righteousness and Christ first. And of course, there is a hell to those who remain at home in their sins and depravity and evil and a defiled conscience. Oh, what an awful thing it is. And I can testify, for many years I lived in a defiled conscience. People spoke to me about the Lord. I knew I was living a life away from God in my life, living in a defiled conscience. Gagging the voice of God speaking to me, ignoring the pricks of conscience. Am I speaking to someone here today? Have you been kicking against the pricks of conscience? God, who is holy and just, must punish evil, else he would not be a holy God, else he would not be a God of holiness and justice. Fourthly, the word overcome signifies to conquer, to conquer, doesn't it? Sin and evil in our hearts 
and lives must be conquered. We, we cannot be dictated to by our sin and by our evil and think that we have a hope in heaven and that we'll be in paradise with Christ. We cannot be that way. We must have Christ's good government within us. But how? How can we who by nature are sinners, wretched, hell deserving sinners, how? Who by nature, who hearts are desperately wicked, we're like a fugitive on the run from God. How can we overcome such powerful impulses of sin and evil in our lives and through the world and the devil? How can we do this? Well, in the wisdom and severity and goodness of God, He has provided a Saviour. He has provided His Saviour who would overcome our sin and our death and who would conquer sin and death on the cross of Calvary in His body and His life. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He was the only one qualified to take away our sin. What did it cost him? It cost him his life. The Prince of Glory, God himself, stepped into history and, according to the prophecy, lived that perfect life that we could never live and suffered and died and, and stepped in the way of a God that must punish sin. And he took on board the punishment that God has to punish sin with for you and for me who believe upon his name for the forgiveness of sins. He bore them away on the cross of Calvary. And friends, he rose and conquered sin and death, making a way for us to be righteous in his sight. We're justified in him if we truly depart and turn from evil and sin and look to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ alone for his righteousness. The Saviour is the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How amazing this is. That we who are so depraved of evil and sinful, that we could be made the righteousness of God. That God would look upon us and suffer in our stead and be punished for us and impute his righteousness to us as if we've never sinned, as if we've never failed God, as if we've never said a sinful word, had a mean thought, done evil to others. All our sins upon Christ, punished and dealt with, and Christ has overcome them. He has conquered them, especially for you. That's what it cost him to do that. God giving his holy life for you. Do you believe in it? Do you believe in it? Do you believe in it with all your heart? Or do you believe that you're not as bad as the Bible says that you are? You're not as bad as God's word says that you are? That actually you're a good person? Think about it. You see, friends, you're not qualified to overcome your sin and evil in your life, and neither am I. We're not qualified to do so. Only Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the living Son of God, because only Jesus Christ can satisfy the divine justice of God upon sin. God must punish sin, else he is no longer God, else he is no longer a God of justice. Now, we don't want a God of justice, but we try to, don't we? We try to make just a God of love. That's what we see in many churches today. Just a God of love, not a God of justice. But God is a God of justice. He must punish sin. Nothing that defiles can ever enter into heaven. Therefore, only those who are in Christ can be saved. Jesus Christ was punished for all of your sins. Do you believe in it? But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. Romans 5, 8. How can we overcome the sin 
that so easily beset us and in our, in our lives and the evil within our lives. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe upon him for the forgiveness of sins. Believe on him that has only done good and who is qualified to take away your sin. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet per, yet per adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, his precious holy blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, reconciled we shall be saved by his life. His holy life saved us, friends. He rose with me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He is risen. Jesus Christ, the Almighty Son of God, the Savior, has conquered sin and evil and death and has made a way for us to be righteous in his sight. And for the true believer, this is the one most wonderful news, isn't there? Believe. Believe on the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of every single one of your sins. Not just some of them. Every single sin that you've ever committed and that you will ever commit. Believe on the name of Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You will be born of the Holy Spirit of God. And like the Apostle Paul and his exhortation to the Romans, there will be a transfer transforming effect in your heart and your life. God will work and transform your life and he will make you to depart from evil and to put in place those things which are God honouring, those means of grace, reading the scriptures, spending time with him, true repentance, true faith towards him, true belief that these books that we have in front of us is this holy book, a loving for the Lord, and pr new principles and desires in life. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? If you truly do, if you've understood these three points, that that the, the power, that the, the, the evil and sin within your heart. If you've truly responded to it and departed from evil so that you may live in Christ and what he has done in overcoming evil in the good, the perfect work of atonement uh, on the cross of Calvary for you, especially for you. If you believe on that with all your heart, he promises that he will save you. You will have the Holy Spirit, be given the Holy Spirit. You will have new desires and principles in your life. God will guide you and bless you. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.